Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Sessions Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Understanding God's Loving Laws Group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the Human Transformation Principles Question and Answer presentation, Jesus answers questions from the audience about the material covered in the previous presentation, Human Transformation Principles. Recorded on the 26th of November, 2016, in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. Okay, here we go. So our session this time is trans Human Transformation Principles Question and Answer. Um, some good questions and answers. So um, if we can start with, uh, let's start with Claudia, where are you? Yep, thank you. And after Claudia, can we go to Nikki, who's on that side? Is there anybody on this side? Where's Richard? There's Richard over there. If you can hand a mic to Richard, you'll be down the line a bit though, Richard. So, is that all right? Okay. Claudia. Could you clarify the objective to create the external potential for every soul to understand God and receive communication and substances from God? Yes, I'll go even further and clarify both the internal and the external. Does that make sense? Because <laughs> I think we need to sort of understand that a little better. The soul itself has been created um, a certain way. So you can see with the creation of the soul, in order for it to receive a substance that, it, that doesn't belong to it, it has to have mechanisms built into the soul to allow the reception of those substances. Now, if the reception of those substances happen to be from another soul, so a feeling of love is a substance, it's, a, it's an energy form, isn't it? Energy, transmission of energy between one soul and the other, then obviously to receive an emotion from another person, you've got to have the inbuilt mechanisms inside of your own soul that enables you to receive that particular substance or energy from the other person. That makes sense, doesn't it? All right, well now let's inject our God soul. Now remember God's the infinite, but I'll draw God like this just so that we can just draw it in terms of this two-dimensional space and reception of energy, you can see that there's a number of things that have to be created to enable this soul to receive a substance from the infinite. You see, it's one thing for it to receive a substance or an emotion or an energy that's not infinite, right? Quite another for it to receive one that's got a quality of infinite in it. So there has to be mechanisms which would, which would call potential mechanisms, some potentials, in the soul that allow, you could say they're internal because they have to exist within the soul, that allow this soul to receive substances from the infinite. Does that make sense? So you can see there has to be inbuilt things inside of this soul that allows this soul to receive these substances. But there also has to be a mechanism that allows for the transmission of such substances or the transmission of such uh, feelings and emotions from the infinite to the finite. And these kind of mechanisms are basically allowing the flow of information or energy from the infinite. So we've got the flow of energy from the infinite to the finite. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Right? So you could say there are external potentials that also had to be created, which actually must have a whole series of laws governing them. Now, when we, when we talk about the flow of God's love in particular, so if we discuss the flow of love, and this, we're talking about not the agape love, remember, which is the principled base love, because that's flowing automatically to all creation at all times. But this is the personal love that God has specifically for the human soul. When we talk about the flowing of this love, there's got to be a mechanism, an external mechanism, that allows for the transmission of that soul, from, of that love from God's soul, the great oversoul, to the soul of the finite, your soul, your, the human soul, which you could say are the potentials external to the human soul that also have to exist to allow for the transmission of any form of substance from God. 
So in the case of love, the, the, the external potentials are defined by what I called in the first century the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit being a conduit governed by law and in particular the laws of love, truth and desire. Right? So the Holy Spirit only kept connects to the human soul and there has to be a mechanism by, via which in the human soul via which this love can flow, doesn't there? Otherwise, it doesn't matter how much God would make it flow and it doesn't matter if the Holy Spirit existed. If there wasn't a mechanism via which the Holy Spirit could connect to the soul, then the human soul would still be incapable of receiving that love. Does that make sense? So God, knowing that God wanted it to supply God's personal love in the future to human souls who had the desire, created firstly the potential for that to occur inside of the soul itself. And then he created a whole series of laws that govern the flow of things from himself to those finite souls. But one of which of those things is the Holy Spirit, which is the conduit that allows love to flow. But who knows, there might be other conduits of different types, potentially an infinite number, of conduits of different types, allowing an infinite number of personal things coming from God to enter the human soul in the future. We don't know, right? But there must be mechanisms external to the human soul that allow for those transmissions to occur, besides the potential that exists inside of the soul itself that allows for it to receive it. Does that make sense to you, Claudia? Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. So when we talk in the outline about those external potentials and internal potentials, what we're basically suggesting is the soul had to be designed a specific way internally to allow for God's love, something of the infinite, to enter it. And also, on top of that, there had to be mechanisms. I example, the Holy Spirit is one such mechanism – or that are governed by a series of laws that govern the connection between God and the soul itself to allow for such energies and such substance of, of God to flow into the soul. Okay, thank that you. Makes sense? Yep, good question. Okay, a few of you asked that question, so that was good. Nikki, uh, your questions one, two, and three. Thanks, mate. All right. Uh, one. What parts of God's attributes and character can be absorbed by the human soul? Well, that is a question I can't answer, actually, because I don't know yet all the parts of God's attributes and qualities, firstly. And secondly, I don't know which ones of them the human soul is able to absorb either. And thirdly, I don't know what mechanisms have been created to allow those flows of of energy types of energy to the human soul does that make sense yep. Yep. so that there's three issues with answering your question you've got to know all of those three things before you can answer the question mm -hmm. so but we can again we can assume a number of things given god's infinite nature given god's infinite nature there might there might be infinite an infinite number of parts and that of attributes that we can receive from god does that make sense yeah and in fact, when you do receive God's love, you also receive a number of things that God um, has. An example of that is uh, in the spirit body form, when this soul has received enough of God's love to, tran trans um, to, to transfer between the seventh and the eighth dimensions, in other words, the soul becomes at one with God, the spirit body of that soul is now able to move through the physical universe unbound uh, from the spheres that it currently is in down, unbound by time and unbound by space. So that means that you can have a desire from that moment on, you have a desire to be somewhere and you're there. There's no sense of travelling there. But before that time, that doesn't exist. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that means that every form of travel before the eight sphere, there was always a, like, you, you're always conscious of time going past as you're traveling. Uh -huh. But after the eight sphere transition, 
seventh to eighth, you have the instant desire to be at some place and you're there. Of course, you've got to know where that place is before you can go there. But when you have an instant desire to be there, you're there. It's just quite simple. So you're now not bound by space. You now can instantly traverse space, but only within the spheres of development. Do you follow? But when you're in the 36th, 35th sphere, just before the 36th, you have the ability to, of course, do this between any other sphere and the sphere you're in. Does it make sense? Mm. Now, these abilities were not with you before you made the transition from the 7th to the 8th. So that's an indication that not only did you receive God's love, but you must have received something else God had too as a part of receiving that love, do you see? Yep. And, what, and that thing is this, um, well, the spirits have all sorts of ways of describing it, but basically you call, could call it instantaneous travel, couldn't you? Yep. Within the bounds of your development. Now that's an example of you having received something else from God mm. that wasn't there before as a part of receiving God's love. Mm. right? So the reality is as you receive God's love, you also receive other attributes of God that love has a part of. And, uh, and this is an interesting fact that we finish up receiving a lot of different kinds of things from God, different abilities that we did not have before. Another example of it is uh, when you make the seventh to eighth sphere transition, you, you also receive the ability to process information much more rapidly. Right? Because you're now connected to the way God processes information. So now you're still limited by the eighth sphere condition, and obviously this continually increases thereafter. But you can now, ha tra you can now um, understand things much more rapidly than you can before. Before there had to be a part of your intellectual process of your spirit body involved in the assimilation of information. After the eighth sphere, only your soul-based intellectual process now gets used in processing information. And this is an emotionally based process that is much more rapid. And in fact, as you can see, emotions can actually leave your soul and go outside of the universe, in fact. So that's the way God's designed emotion. And so, so this gives you the ability now to actually communicate even with God, once you use emotions, that's how you communicate with God, obviously. And you're communicating with something outside of, your, outside of the known universes at the time. So, so you start utilising this particular feature of your soul and you didn't use it before. You were limited a lot by your physical mind instead. So there's, a, there, there's obviously many things we already know we have received, but what I'm suggesting to you, oh, I'm running out of voice now. What I'm suggesting to you is that I don't know the answer to your question because I don't know all of God's attributes and character that I can receive. Yep. And I don't know the mechanisms by, via which reception is possible. Mm. Make sense? Yep. Yep. You want to ask your second? Yep. Um, um, I'll just go to Mary for a moment because I think there's a spirit who wants to. <laughs> there's like there's a, a lot of spirits ton. who want to ask a question about that, about that. Just we can talk to them later if you'd like because they're all six fear spirits and they all want to know more about. Um, it's not actually strictly about connecting to God. It's about the qualities of love and movement through the spheres and stuff like that. Yeah, so, I think we have the conversation yeah. with them later. Yeah. Yep. Mary and I often have conversations that none of you have ever um, heard with other people, obviously. We don't record everything. And so quite often the conversation is quite fascinating, as you can imagine. Mm. Okay, your, thir your second question. Second, yeah. In order to be 100% aware of your own immortality, does that mean recognising completely that God and God's love is immortal, therefore it can never be taken away once received to a certain point? Well, you might think that's what it means, recognising, but actually it's more of a feeling. It's a feeling, emotional state, rather than an intellectual one. So it's like the difference between 
knowing that something is possible and actually doing it. Do you see what I'm saying? So let's, uh, if I give you an example of that, uh, let's say I say to you that teleportation is possible. You go, oh yeah, no worries, it's possible. There's an intellectual state there where you, you might even believe it's possible in your mind, mm. but it's not truly something you know until you've actually done it, is it? True. Once you've done it, then you can say, I know for certain this is the state I'm in. Now when you receive God's love to the point of becoming a one with God, there's a difference between knowing that ha if you have received a part of God, you must become immortal, because since God is immortal, that, and actually feeling that you are now immortal. Mm -hmm. There's a completely different, it's a completely different experience, right? As you can imagine. The emotional experience is much more powerful, obviously, and, uh, and therefore much more convincing as well. And when I say much more convincing, it's a complete conviction, not only based upon your idea or concept, but now upon the reality. You know you can't die after that point. Okay. And you know that God can't destroy you, even God can't destroy you, without destroying a part of herself. Mm. See, before then, God could mm. destroy you without destroying a part of herself. Does that make sense? God created you. It makes sense that God then has the ability to destroy you, does it not? But if a part of God is now in you, it's impossible for God to destroy you without destroying herself. So, so that's the theory of it. But actually feeling that in practice is very, very different than the theory of it. Mm. Because you imagine... Would you worry about dying? Would you worry about people hurting you? Would you worry about... Would you worry about anything, do you think, after that, really? <laughs> nothing. <yeah>. No, nothing. Because <laughs> you know you're in order anyway, it doesn't really matter. Mm. You wouldn't even be worried about what there is to learn anymore. You wouldn't be concerned about any of those things. Everything's driven by desire anyway. You don't, there's no such thing as fear after that point. That makes sense, doesn't it? No such thing as fear. Fear does not exist after that point. So that means even fear does not exist for you in your physical form or your spirit form either doesn't exist. You're now fearless as an emotional condition yeah, because of the feeling of immortality. Ooh. So that was the state I felt in the first century on earth and naturally that meant that I wasn't afraid of anybody killing me or I wasn't afraid of anyone getting upset with me and I wasn't afraid of any of those things <laughs> because uh, and you know if someone wanted to throw me off the cliff I wasn't afraid of that either and that happened quite a number of times. So um, <laughs> You know, I wasn't afraid of those conditions being... And I wasn't afraid of saying something that would make that happen even. Or, you know, trigger that person to do that to me. Does that make sense yeah, to you? Yeah, it does, yeah. Yeah. Wasn't afraid of having to leave my girl because I knew I wasn't leaving her. Mm. Right? Yeah. Things like that. Yeah. Lovely spot to be in, obviously. And it only comes... Once you're at one with God, yeah. Okay, question, next Three. question. Yeah. Mm. It can be seen that the highest of God's principles and laws act on our desire. Does that mean our <laughs> attitudes towards emotion and pain will change so that we come to love experiencing them as it means we have the opportunity to grow close to God, but not in a sadistic way? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good question. <laughs> Yes, it does mean that. So when you truly understand desire, and this is why I know the majority, you know, pretty much the most of you at this stage don't understand it. But when you truly understand desire, you are no longer afraid of pain mm -hmm. or emotion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, it, that also is a lovely place to be in. You can be in that place at a qu in quite a low condition, actually. Mm -hmm. You can be in that place. You can see that if you truly understood desire, that desire is driving your whole existence now, you can see that even your redemption is a desire-driven process if you so choose, and your transformation is a desire-driven process if you so choose. So you, you would then consider, well, why would I not choose, given the fact that it's much faster and more rapid? Um, the only reason why I perhaps would not choose is because I'm afraid of pain or emotion. Yeah. Right? 
Now, once I truly engage desire at the soul level, at an emotional level, you will no longer be afraid of pain or emotion. And, and particularly, um, you know, usually that happens fairly early in the stages of, of developing with God's love being received. And when I say fairly early, it's not usually something that happens um, for, for the majority of people to the third or fourth or fifth spheres. So, um, so on earth that would mean quite a bit of love needs to be received first before you get into that stage. But you can see that once you are in that stage, you'd no longer be afraid of having a cry or feeling ashamed or feeling guilty or any of those things. And you can see the more you release the fear of a certain emotion, the more freedom you have. So, for example, if I'm not afraid of being ashamed, it, I could still have shame in me, right? <coughs> but if I'm not afraid of feeling ashamed, then somebody can't manipulate me with shame. I'm no longer controllable by shame. Mm -hmm. If I'm not afraid of feeling guilt anymore as an emotion, then it means that people can still try to make me guilty and I still may have guilt within me, but I'm, if I'm no longer afraid to feel it, then it means that they can try attempt to manipulate me with guilt, but I, I won't be able to be manipulated yeah. with guilt. The same applies to sadness, anger and any other form of emotion, right? So if I'm not afraid of, of my emotions, it's also highly likely that I'll be less afraid of others having an emotion as well. Which means I allow others to have emotions as well without feeling that there's something personal. If they have an emotion of desire for someone other than me, if it's my partner, she has a desire for someone other than me, then I won't be afraid of that feeling that it would generate in me because I'm not afraid of my emotions. Mm. So I'm no longer trying to control her desires. I'm no longer trying to force her into doing something else, you see. So, so yes, so you can see that our attitudes towards emotion and pain, if we truly understood desire and the power of it, mm -hmm. um, our attitude towards emotion and pain would change quite rapidly, really, and we would start to have a very strong feeling of no matter what pain or emotion I need to experience, if I desire to experience it, I'm going to do better than if I'm forced <laughs> into experiencing it. All right? given the, the laws and how they operate, and particularly how the old laws of redemption and transformation operate, you would think that you would then start to embrace, embrace that. So that means that whenever many of you get resistive, I know you still really don't get the concept of desire. And therefore you don't get the concept of choosing to feel emotional pain rather than avoiding emotional pain. And this, this then causes you to be driven by the avoidance of pain, as we discussed in the will, the very first group, the will group. Driven by the avoidance of pain is because we are afraid of pain and afraid of the emotions associated with it. So obviously, if we had desire, we would, I, we would even though we have these things within us, we would choose to feel them. Desire, not just choose, but desire to feel them. We yeah. want to feel them, want to go through them. And we would not be as resistive as we are towards emotions because we understand that feeling emotion is the fastest transformational period, period of our life if we feel emotion. Not only that, we can see through this discussion that anything we receive from God is obviously going to be emotional given that God communicates via two forms, mathematics and emotion, and both of them uh, transmit information to us, we can see the need for us to learn how to be emotional. Mm. And, and so we would go, okay, is every time I shut down my emotions here, what am I doing? I'm shutting down the potential of my own transformation as well as just shutting down my own emotional experience. Mm. So it's a very powerful thing mm. to actually come to that awareness and I suggest pretty much everyone here has yet to really come to that awareness. But once you do, now your desire to experience your emotion is very strong and you, your desire to release pain through experience is very strong and you're no longer governed by avoidance of the painful experience. When you think about it, all addictions are is 
avoiding painful experiences. That's all they're there for, right? Yeah. So many of you are so worried about your addictions and deconstructing your addictions, but the reality is they'll all go away from you once you stop avoiding painful emotional experiences. In other words, once you stop avoiding pain, your addictions will leave you. Mm. So that's a very rapid way of addressing most of your addictions. Of course, we need to gain the awareness of that before we'll do it. Mm. So that's a problem for most of us. We, we need to first go through the harder way to gain an awareness and then, then we can embrace the easier way. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot, Rob. Yeah, good. Thank you. Um, now, um, my next one was Richard. Thank you. So, up the back there. Regarding God's principles and laws in the process of human transformation, if there is a robust intellectual acceptance contrasted by a violent emotional rejection, <laughs> what are yeah. the chief mechanisms to address this disharmony? Yeah, good question, Richard. Uh, I like how you said it, a robust intellectual acceptance, so you sort of get it in your head, and then there's a, a contrast by a violent emotional rejection. <laughs> and uh, that is exactly what it's like often, right? Yeah, it's a good question because um, obviously this disharmony results in no real change because given the fact that desire is an emotion uh, and it's desire that causes change, you can see that if no real desire at an emotional level exists, then, then no change is really possible. And this is the trouble we have, is that we can intellectually accept things and think that we get it, but without the, without the emotional acceptance and also the emotional de the desire changing, we're not going to emotionally get it. And, and if we don't emotionally get it, then it's, from God's perspective, it's like we haven't got it, uh, even though we think we have. So that is a problem, and how do you address it? Well, I think partially my last question with Nikki will help in the sense that we have to start de desiring. We need to get to the point of desiring to go through emotional pain, to go through an emotional experience. Any violent emotional rejection is always caused by some underlying emotional pain existing in the soul that says, reject this, reject this, reject this. It's too hard. It's too, you know, it could be that it's too hard. It's too big. It's too powerful. It's going to change your life too much. It's going to mean a destruction of different areas of your life that you don't want it to destroy or whatever. There's obviously fears associated emotionally that cause an emotional rejection and particularly a violent one. So, so what do we need to do? We need to obviously address the fears associated with that, with, the, with what those are. Now, to address any fear, we have to first develop a desire to look at the fear, see what it is, and start examining it. So that can just begin, isn't, couldn't it, with the question, why am I so afraid of accepting this? asking for help from other people around you and from God to show you why you're so afraid is a shift in desire. So all we need to do is at least shift our desire one tiny little bit from our current exercise of our will when it comes to changing our emotional condition. So that's what we need to do. Now, in our second group, our assistance group two, we define that entire process of how to do that. So I think if you, if you go back to that, that sort of goes through that process of what to do to get rid of these things. But the reason why I wanted to answer your question is because it demonstrates um, that you can think something in your head while at the same time being complete emotional disharmony with that. And yet, remember, God is looking at your attitudes, your emotions and everything. He measures these things. The laws measure those things. So, so you can see that unless we develop some kind of a desire to change the emotional condition, no matter what we've intellectually received, we're not going to change. And this is something we need to address. But that also is addressed by a desire. Again, just be asking the question, why do I want to really stay in this state? What do I, am I going to do something about it? Just these basic questions that can help you shift your desire. Awesome. Sense? Thank you. Yeah. If we go to Pierre, where are you, Pierre? Yep. Your question number three, mate, if we could have that.
I'm a bit lost there. You'll mm. be lost? Yeah. Is the transformation mm. is transformation the process of God? Oh yeah. Is transformation the Oh sorry. I'm sorry. Is the transformation the process of um God turning our soul from a f f finite 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 yep finite creature into a potentially infinite creature by accepting parts of the infinite in our soul yeah yep good observation it is exactly that so basically what we're doing remember the soul had to have the inbuilt potentials internally to actually allow it to receive parts of the infinite even though it's a finite creature right in its natural state and there had to be mechanisms that were created which is all part of the transformation principles that allow something from an infinite being to be transmitted to a finite creature obviously there has to be attenuation going on here when i say attenuation what i mean is if god pumped all of god's infinite love into that creature instantly what would happen Bang. Boom! No, the, you, it wouldn't handle it, would it? It's like it, it's like this. There'd be this terrible. In fact, from a scientific point of view, it'd be one of the greatest. It's like an atomic bomb happening in the physical world. You know, it's like that kind of thing would happen to the soul. So, so you, you, there has to be some form of method that uh, laws that govern how much, how much flow of the infinite even though the thing is infinite how does it get scaled down and pumped into the finite and change it you see there has to be some finite limiting process that allows the infinite substance to be to be controlled in such a manner to enter the finite without harming it does that make sense and so you're right there are the transformation principles are exactly what does that they they control that they control and it, and and the reality is god made it controlled by desire so how much you desire is how much you receive and but there are mathematical formulas controlling the whole thing of course and but the if the infinite will be received in proportion to the amount of desire you have for it now that's interesting in itself because that basically tells you that if you had a huge desire your soul is capable because of the desire opening up some again some pathways in your soul your soul is capable of receiving to that huge amount right now of course a finite soul isn't capable of having an infinite desire so the, so it's safe from ever receiving the full infinite burst <laughs> does that make sense and uh, and in fact it's unable to because of its finite nature but but you can see that the the law is the law governing it is controlled by the desire principle so the transformation principles design the potential in the soul and the external mechanisms that allow for the reception and the desire principle controls how much of it happens at any one point in time and it's always safe <laughs> and it's always safe yes so oftentimes you won't think so <laughs> that's true because most of the time when you receive even just a little bit of god's love you'll burst out crying and you'll cry sometimes you cry for hours and maybe sometimes even days and uh, just in being over in an overwhelmed state now for most people when they first start that process being in an overwhelmed state for that amount of time is unbearable and so they close down their desire right so the key is again to as we talked to nikki about allowing emotions and and even allowing positive emotions to overwhelm you is a difficult condition to get into because initially on earth we don't allow anything to overwhelm us we have severe control over emotions of all kind whether they are painful or pleasurable so obviously this means allowing more and more overwhelming emotional experiences yep now many of you feel like oh i allow one overwhelming emotional experience that's enough now <laughs> well if that's enough now that's where you'll stagnate right so we need to come to see that actually every time we disallow an overwhelming emotional experience we're disallowing the transformation of our soul 
by definition, receiving a part of the infant is going to expand this soul beyond its current capability. That means beyond its current capability of experiencing emotion. That means that you're going to have to be overwhelmed every time you receive God's love, every time. And that will be the case once you're at one with God as well, and even above that. But you are not crying anymore. Sorry? But you are not crying. Oh, yeah, you'll cry. But it won't be in pain, will it? But you'll be overwhelmed by the sensation. Surely you will, every time. And because God's infinite, it's going to happen every time. So can you imagine if you're, you're controlling overwhelming emotional experiences right now, you have one of these overwhelming expo emotional experiences with God, you're going to probably shut down the rest, right? Yep, but, but God's basically saying, I want you to get used to constantly being overwhelmed. <laughs> Interesting. That's what we need to do, let ourselves be constantly overwhelmed. And, and this is something that is really good to do, actually to allow yourself to be constantly overwhelmed. Yeah. It's, a, it's a beautiful thing. The more you can allow yourself to be constantly overwhelmed by God, the faster you're going to progress. It's just a simple, simple thing, isn't it? Now, can you see that if you don't want to be constantly overwhelmed, your desire is going to sometimes be there, sometimes not be there. Given that desire is the, is the key, the, the mechanism that drives transformation, can you see that's a major problem? Limiting your desire limits your transformation. We need to concentrate on this desire, really, to be yeah, constantly, desire. to open, to be constantly overwhelmed by pain. Yeah, by well, not just by pain, because, because the reality is initially pain will be overwhelming, will allow being overwhelmed by it, but, it, but after you've made the transition into one with God, there is no pain. It's just pleasure. But you've got to get used to being overwhelmed by that as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. And most people are not willing to be overwhelmed by either pain or pleasure. Hence the he heavy lid that we have on our pressure cooker. And now we're forced into a will-based human redemption process, which is where most of us are. That's the reason why we're where we are. So this, is, this gets back to your second group, doesn't it? The AG assistance group two, where we talked, when AG one, assistance group one, we talked about will and the four components of emotion, truth. Remember, emotion was one of those components. Emotion, truth, faith, which is all desire, and love. They were the An four action. components we talked about, didn't we? And then in the second group, we talked about like being willing to experience overwhelming emotion and dealing with your fears of overwhelming emotion, didn't we? As a primary blocking agent. Remember that global that global terror you have? That's what it's all about, right? So addressing that is going to have a large effect on your desire. Large effect on your desire. So you can see that a lot of these principles, we, we look at them and then when we go back to our previous talks with you, you can see that there's, an inter there's a relationship and we need to probably go back there and go, okay, now with my current understanding of the principles, when I go back to these other talks, what, what happens? How does it affect me now compared to how it did before? Mm. So that's a good question. Thank you. Ben. Thank you. Now I'm up to uh, who's next? Max, where are you? Yep, if we can have... Uh, your question number two first, <laughs> and then your question number one next. Okay. Is that right? Yep. Is the Holy Spirit governed by the principle of transformation? And does this mean the Holy Spirit will be the messenger of God's love, attributes, characteristics, etc., etc., throughout our eternal development? Yes, yeah, so there's two parts to this question. Is the Holy Spirit governed by the principle of transformation? The answer to that question no. obviously is no. Yes. Well, you said it was outside. No, it's governed by the principle. Oh, the principle, right. If you hold the mic there with you. You can't use the mic point because <laughs> I can't hear you. <laughs> it's governed by the principle. It's one of the external rules governed by the principle of uh, human transformation that allow for something from the infinite to enter the finite, but in this case, allow for love to go from the infinite to the finite. Does that make sense? Right. So 
You're s so the answer to the, is the Holy Spirit governed by the principle of tra transformation? Yes, it is. It's one of the external rules that God created as a result of the desire to transform us and therefore is governed by the principle. Then the second question is, does this mean the Holy Spirit will be the messenger of God's love, attributes, character, etc. throughout our eternal development? Well, it certainly is the messenger, if you like, of God's love mm -hmm. in the sense that it is the conduit through which the love flows mm -hmm. and it's governed by rules which include the rule of truth in other words, this soul has to be in a condition of purity with regard to truth, wanting truth, mm -hmm. wanting the love in a sincere way, then the Holy Spirit can connect and therefore the love flows. But we don't know whether other attributes of God can flow through the same conduit. So there may be other conduits, conduits for other Which attributes. will name other things probably in yep. time. Which, which allow for other attributes of God to flow. Does that make sense? We don't know. Oh, well, this, at this stage, we do know that the Holy Spirit is definitely the conduit, what we've called or termed. Of course, God mm -hmm. doesn't call it that, does he? Mm -hmm. But we've termed the, the Holy Spirit, in order for a definition to occur, uh, is the conduit through which love flows. But we don't know if that same conduit can be used for other mm -hmm. conditions or inf parts of the infinite to flow. And the reason why you don't know is because obviously the Holy Spirit has a controlling attenuation over the love as it's flowing, driven by desire. We don't know what other attributes might be driven by other characteristics of the human soul that develop in time. So we don't know whether other attributes will be driven by something else other than desire. So we only can know what we know. And the other things are all ideas or concepts that we can uh, investigate and eventually discover but but at the moment are not known can i just ask when you said before about the connection between love which is external to yep. directly to god yep and that that has its own set of of, of principles or, or laws outside of the universe well, is that uh, different to the law of transformation i've drawn this as this oh. is the love coming from the internet entity but the reality is it's really coming from God's nature through God's principles, isn't it? Because the principles are all based upon love. So the reality is you could basically draw it like this, couldn't you? So it's not, that, it's not, follow, it's not flowing a long distance because it's only really going from there <laughs> to there. Okay, it? that makes yeah. more sense to me, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, but it is still that emotion which comes from God's nature of love which comes from the entity of God, obviously. Yep. But it is still governed by this transformation principle. The transformation principles are interesting in this regard because they're not, they actually allow the human soul to send and receive substances that, ex that exceed the external boundaries of the current known universes. So they go outside of the current known universes and into God, mm -hmm. given the fact that there could be even many in the future, inf an infinite number of universes created, we don't know, mm -hmm. right? Given that potential to occur, then, it, then you can basically assume that it's traveling, it might be traveling a long distance in terms of distance, mm -hmm. right? But it's an instantaneous transmission, not bound by the physical limitations of the universes. So transformation principles are interesting like that in that they're not bound by the physical limitations of the current known universes. Mm. And, and that link, the Holy Spirit, that's a gift that's, that we don't know how long that's going to be available to us for. It's not the Holy Spirit that's the gift. Um, the Holy um, Spirit is the, the mechanism and therefore the law-based mechanism. Yep. The love is the gift. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And we don't know how long that w any one of God's gifts that God uh, offers us, we don't know how long they will be offered, mm. as you would assume for any gift. And the reality is that some gifts may be dependent upon the reception of other gifts. So in other words, if you, receive, if you don't receive love, there's certain things you can't do anymore, yeah. right? And maybe there's other gifts that first require us mm. to receive love to a certain point, before the other gift can be received. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So there might be a hierarchy of gifts 
each dependent upon, and by the way, that's highly likely, right, given the fact that we've talked about the hierarchy principle, mm. there might be a hierarchy of gifts which mm. God might be wanting to offer but cannot offer unless we first receive the first gift. Mm. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. As, as is most things <laughs> that God does, right? <laughs> you could pretty much say everything. Okay, let's go to your first question. Um, is the desire that leads to the everlasting engagement of the transformation principle the sincere heartfelt desire to be closer to God? Um, yes, you could say that. Uh, yes, it, it, but it's a, when you say a sincere heartfelt desire, it's, it's very much an emotional thing. It's not just an intellectual concept or anything. It's an emotional place. But yes, it is exactly that. A sincere heartfelt desire to be closer to God. So, so that means there's a to and fro going on. Firstly, to receive love from God, but also to give love to God. See, see interestingly, God can't demand your love. And love is the only thing you can really give to God that, that God hasn't already got. Isn't it? In a lot of ways. God's got a lot of things, right? But he hasn't got your love specifically until you choose to give it. Right? So, so it's your gift to God. See, many of you have not given that much consideration either. That loving God, and this is why the last, very last assistance group is loving God. Because most people don't consider that their love for God is a gift to God. And God has huge emotional responses about your love for him. Uh, isn't that interesting? Yeah, it wouldn't be much of a relationship if it was just one way. Correct, correct. Yeah, it would not be one, would it? It wouldn't be a relationship at all if it was just one way. So, so many people sort of start having this longing for God without, without actually having a desire to love God and when they begin, but that is not tolerated for very long by God, as you can imagine, because, because God wants this two-way relationship. Right? So you cannot just have a longing for, for God and, and no love for God for very long. Right? So when you're in the hills, you can do it, certainly. But once you get above the hills and into the second sphere, you'll find that your love for God has already grown to the point where now you are wa wanting God to feel that you love God, not just wanting to feel from God that God loves you. Yeah. So it's certainly something that we need to consider, and we will be doing a consideration of that subject in the future. Mm. Thanks. Good day. Uh, Rebecca, can we come to you? Thank you. I'm meant to be finishing in 10 minutes. Okay. Yep, so your, your question number two, Rebecca. Um, I think I remember it. You remember it? Is it... Um how can you expect Want me to read it? and yeah <laughs> you said here how do you desire a gift god's love without expecting it right it isn't expecting it not what faith is right good question right um and and it f naturally follows on really doesn't it from max's question in a way all right so let's uh, let's have a look at this emotion of expectation shall we so maybe I need to just rub this part off over one off. What, what to you is an expectation? Isn't it, let's, we, should we use other, other words for it? If we expect something, a really strong expectation would be a demand, wouldn't it? Okay. What's a really like soft expectation? Maybe hope. A wish? What else? I didn't get it. A what? A plea. A plea. Uh, I don't know about that, but that's sort of a desperation thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. These are more sort of like, <clears throat> I would like, oh, I'm going to get that, right? I'm going to get it. Now let's look at the word gift for a moment. 
Now, this is a problem with humanity is that Christmas time and birthday times and everything, what do we notice when it comes to the word gift? Gifts are expectations, expectations really, aren't they? You're expecting it. Yeah? Uh, is that not true? Okay. Are they then really gifts? No, because you expected them and you demanded them. And, and in fact, because you expected them, you don't even really treat them as gifts. You're not as thankful because you already thought that you deserved it. Is that not true? So it really comes from this feeling of, I deserve it. Don't they? These things, expectations. Okay, now when we look at this word gift, we can see that we've got some what you would call human hangovers, haven't you? With regard to gifts, most of you have been involved in your life where you've, you know, birthdays you get presents and Christmas you get presents and when somebody doesn't give you a present you feel offended. <laughs> most, most people feel offended, don't they? Don't? Yeah. What's wrong with that person? Didn't give me a gift. I'm not giving them one next year either. <laughs> we have a quid pro quo, is that the word we're looking for? Um, where, you know, if someone gives us a gift, we'll give them a gift. And then sometimes we feel like, oh, I wish they wouldn't give me a gift, then I've got to buy them one. <laughs> you know, we have all these kind of things going on. That all t tells us, that that should tell us, that none of those things we're actually treating as gifts at all. That's what it should tell us. We're actually got a feeling we deserve it it's really a demand or an expectation really and the the indication of a demand or expectation is if you don't receive it you get upset can you see that you get angry or you get upset or you get offended or you get you have some kind of reaction right so it's really driven by anger in the long run these feelings driven by anger it's because in our childhood, oftentimes we got things, we received things, we got things that, that we then sort of learn to expect con to continue getting rather than seeing each thing that we receive as a gift. Does that make sense to you, Rebecca? Okay, so now we look at this word gift, which is what God's love is, and all of the transformational principles really are a part of this gift. It's a mechanism via which we receive love. So... Obviously, even the principles themselves are a gift to humanity, allowing the infinite transformation of the soul. So when we examine this gift word, can you see these words don't really apply? Can you see that? That's different, isn't it, to having this other word that we're using? But we'll, let's use a few different words for it. It's desire, or you could say longing. What other words could you use? You could use the word aspiration, yeah. You could use the word faith, remember? Seek. A yearning. Well, yearning. Seeking. And so forth. Now, can you see the attitude of these different words are very, very different, aren't they? Can you see if you had a seeking feeling, a yearning for a gift? Can you see when you received it, what would you feel inside of yourself? Oh, just be overwhelmed with another emotion, wouldn't you? Which would be, let's look at the emotions, thankful, grateful, gratitude. Wouldn't you feel overwhelmed? Huh? Surprised, delighted, all those kind of words, right? Can you see that? So what do you notice here? If you truly viewed God's love as a gift, this is what you'd feel. You wouldn't feel these things and you wouldn't get angry if you didn't get it. You wouldn't think you deserve it. See, and this is the interesting thing I notice. When I say or talk about the fact that the opportunity or the gift may no, not be offered in the future, you know what I feel from the majority of audiences? All these kind of emotions generate anger. 
How can you say that? That doesn't make any sense to me. Why would God do that? That's not fair. What's God doing here? That's inconsistent. And rah, 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 off we go. We have all of these angry emotions as a response. That tells me that your concept of desiring love is not desiring love, but demanding or expecting it. And the reality is, if we look at the human definitions of love, what do they basically say? That we can do that. That we can demand love and get it. That we can de demand love, expect love and receive it. But you can't. Because the whole way the soul works is that when you demand something and you receive it, you're not going to be grateful. And unless you're grateful in your heart, sincerely, then you had a demand or an expectation, not a desire or a longing. Can you see the difference? So it's a very good question and I feel a question that we need to resolve that comes from our childhood experiences of particularly receiving physical gifts but also emotions of love and so forth. We have deep expectations that someone continues to love us not acknowledging that their love is a gift. We can't expect it. And, and this is what I notice in the breakup of relationships. To me, a breakup of a relationship is okay. When we have an angry response about the breakup of a relationship, we demonstrated that we are actually in expectation with regard to love rather than seeing love as a gift. Can you see that? Yep. And so it not only this, uh, this concept not only applies to our relationship with God, but actually applies to every single human relationship we form based on love. This concept of what is a gift, love is a gift, it cannot be demanded, expected, even hoped for or wished for, it can be desired or longed for, it can be aspired to, it can be, we can have faith that we're going to receive it, a desire, seeking desire that we're going to receive it, uh, all those things are valid, but when we don't get it, we would not feel disappointed that we didn't get it, right? Because if we had the right attitude, we'd realise that it's a gift anyway. And if we got it, it's a fantastic thing that we get it. But it's not something we can demand, not something we can expect. Um, so by bringing up our kids as inferior or superior, we're kind of taking away the biggest gift to know how to receive a gift. Yes. They don't know how to receive a gift anymore. An inferior person feels guilty about a gift and a superior person feels they deserve the gift and both of them are incapable of understanding that it was a gift. So when you're inferior, you feel guilty about receiving things, that shows you're incapable of receiving a gift. And when you feel superior, you're also incapable of receiving a gift because <laughs> right? you demand it. So yeah, there's a lot of issues there addressing this area of gifts isn't there and what a gift really means yeah thank you yeah mary would you like to i just wanted to clarify a question from a spirit yeah um could you then say that faith is the knowledge that the gift is possible but not that the gift is an entitlement uh faith is a bit more than that mm -hmm. But, but it, is, it does involve that, is the knowledge that the gift is possible. Not only possible, but an actual fact. So faith is the knowledge that the gift it being offered is an actual fact. But, continue the other part of the statement. But not that the gift is, a, is, is an entitlement. Correct. It's not an entitlement. Yeah. It's not something... An entitlement comes into this area, doesn't it? Expectations and demands. So when you feel entitled, you are demonstrating that you're incapable of receiving a gift because you actually already expect it before you're, you're attempting to receive it. Now, God measures every emotion, remember? So God mathem has mathemat mathematical formulas measuring every emotion. So God knows the difference between a feeling of true, pure desire based on truth and based on the fact that you have faith in the fact and compares that with the feeling of entitlement. And God does not respond to the feeling of entitlement 
all the feeling of demand, all the feeling of expectation, all the feeling you deserve it, right? all of those kind of things. God doesn't respond to that. God responds to the desire, longing, because he can measure that feeling as a different feeling. That's what he responds to. That's what all of the laws respond to as well. And once you do have that, when you do get the gift, you are these things. But if you have that and you get the gift, you go, it was only what I deserved in the first place. It's only what I was entitled to in the first place. So do you truly appreciate it? Not really. Now, you examine a child on earth with this. Many children on earth at Christmas time, they get a gift, what do they do with it? Next day, it's broken, trashed. What does that tell you? They felt entitled for the gift. And because they weren't thankful, they're not even looking after the gift. So what do they do with it? They trash it. And then what do they want? Another gift. <laughs> Can you see an entitlement generates this never-ending desire for more things without any feeling of satisfaction or thankfulness? Yeah, so it's a dangerous state. Yep. They can ask more. It's more about the person. So is it that I must have the humble viewpoint that as one of God's children, God in principle would want to give me her love and this is what faith is? Or is it more of a personal feeling that God must desire to love me? God's already loving you in principle. So this is about God's personal desire to love you. It's about the principle about me. This is about, you. This is about God wanting a relationship with you that this is available to you at the moment. And this is about whether you would like to have this relationship or not, this love-based relationship or not. So it's not about the fact that God just treats everybody the same way or anything like that. This, this is about God wanting to give you specifically part of God because God loves you and wants you to experience this love. So it's a, it's a very much a personal thing, not a principled thing. So no, it is based on principles. <laughs> Sorry. Fire. So my faith is the knowledge that God wants to personally give me as an individual love. No, your faith is the desire that you want this love. Your faith is the desire that you not only know it's possible, but that you actually personally long for it in your own heart. Thank you. That was yep. So it's good to know that. Okay, well, we need to stop there. That's our end of our... Obviously, there's a lot more questions here, which, we, again, we'll have to answer at a later time. Okay, guys, so that comes to the end of the transformation principles. Pretty interesting principles, yes? yes. Yeah. And uh, quite fascinating in terms of how God created them, even allowing for things from the infinite to enter the finite. This is a very interesting concept if you think about it and also has future ramifications for other qualities of God to be received for the soul. So, so this is where you start imagining what the other potentials might be. You know, and it's very hard to imagine those things until you've received the first one, obviously. <laughs> so that's the way it goes. All right, well, now we'll, have a, we'll stop there and have a 10-minute break. So if you can come, past at quarter pa come back at quarter past three and we'll get started on our last, pro our last discussion, which will be knowing and loving God. Mm. Yes.